Well, I, I, to Peter's point, though, I think there's a there's a shift here, right? You know, like the tactile elements and our familiarity with them, and sort of the rituals around some of these things, like physically sticking right, a stamp and yeah. all of that. But you see that shift, you know, like we're seeing the phasing out of checks, for example. You're seeing, are you reading your books as physical books, or are you reading them on Kindle? You know, we've moved away from how oh, many of such, us carry cash. You're such a futurist, aren't you, Zayda? Yeah. How, how many? Of, how, how much cash do you carry now? Do you carry cash? Ooh. You know, <laughs> I've got ten cents in the bottom of my swan, swan dry bag. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know about that. John, thank you for that. Uh, Zaina, Julia, Peter, and Kiara, thank you very much for being with us on Thursday's panel. I'm Wallace Chap, and I'm back tomorrow, Friday. Till then. This is Checkpoint on RNZ National. I'm Lisa Owen. Air Heidi Akine, two carjackings and two innocent bystanders with guns held to their heads during a crime fueled rampage through Auckland. Some women have been waiting more than two years for their benefit sanctions to be reviewed. Is that kind? The Social Development Minister joins us live. This is where I die. The thought that flashed through a police officer's mind as he was shot. Three Australian states are now battling community COVID outbreaks. How long can the trans-Tasman bubble stay afloat? St John Ambulance puts out its own 111 alert. Don't call us unless it's actually an emergency. And give me more choice. Britney Spears finally gets to choose her own lawyer. RNZ News at 5. Kia ora kōsū sanalei with DNA. The police say today's shooting in Auckland was volatile, high risk and life-threatening. Two members of the public were briefly held at gunpoint by a man who carjacked one and attempted to carjack a second person before being shot by police. In the first instance, the offender stole a car in Penrose, crashing it near a traffic island and holding a gun to a person's head. Assistant Commissioner Richard Chambers says after that, the offender then crashed into another car waiting at an intersection on Great South Road. The offender got out of uh, the car that he'd just stolen from another member of the public and approached the driver, waiting patiently at the lights, held the firearm to that person's head, uh, and that's when my staff moved in very quickly. The shot gunman has been arrested and taken to hospital in a serious but stable condition. In another incident, the police say they did their best to take a man into custody safely before he was fatally shot in Hamilton last night. It happened in the suburb of Hillcrest just after 10 o'clock. Police say the man fired at least five shots at them before officers returned fire. Assistant Commissioner Richard Chambers says it's a very sad situation that a life has been lost. When uh, somebody opens fire on my staff, uh, you know, we need to deal with those situations as they present to us. And uh, sadly, as a result of um, what occurred last night, uh, he lost his life. Um, my staff did the best they could to, um, to look after him and, and save him from that, but sadly passed away. Richard Chambers says police sympathies are with the man's family. A police officer wounded moments before the fatal shooting of Matthew Hunt last year says the gunman was also trying to kill him. Eli Epiha admits he murdered Constable Hunt after fleeing a routine traffic stop in the Auckland suburb of Massey and crashing. But in the High Court in Auckland, he has denied the attempted murder of Officer David Goldfinch. On day four of the trial today, Goldfinch has recounted seeing the gunman stop and think before aiming the gun at him and firing. The ground was exploding, like the grass and the concrete, and then I felt one into my hip. A bullet hit me straight in the hip and it just felt like an explosion of acid through my belt. And then very quick succession, it was just hip and then my leg and my calf muscle. David Goldfinch says he thought he was going to die. Melbourne is expected to go into another lockdown to curb the growing COVID-19 outbreak. New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian is warning that COVID-19 numbers in the state are likely to worsen tomorrow. Meanwhile, a fisheries expert says New Zealand could become a magnet for COVID-struck vessels after allowing two Spanish-flagged vessels to dock. 
The Player Zahara vessel on its way to Littleton Port after 16 of its 18 crew tested positive for the virus. Fisheries expert Dr Glenn Simmons says similar Spanish flagged vessels are often crewed by Indonesian nationals fishing for tuna in the Pacific. Simmons says there are currently several thousand similar vessels in the Pacific. And I think what New Zealand has just done is throwing out the welcome mat that if anybody gets a case of COVID, uh, New Zealand's open for business, free hotel, free medical. So we could become a magnet for more than just these two vessels. In Wellington, 16 crew from the Viking Bay are isolating in a Wellington MIQ facility with the Delta variant of COVID-19. The largest shipment yet of the Pfizer vaccine has arrived in New Zealand, carrying about 180,000 doses. A million doses in total are due to arrive this month, meaning about 670,000 more are expected in the next two weeks. The COVID-19 Response Minister Chris Hipkins says the government will begin to build up a stockpile again as the larger shipments turn up. We will look to build up a bit of a buffer as bigger deliveries arrive in so that if a delivery is a day late that that doesn't slow down our vaccine rollout but at the moment we've made the decision that while supply is very constrained the best place for those vaccines to be uh, is in people's arms not in the freezer. It's four and a half, coming up to four and a half minutes past five. Richie Moonga has won the battle for the All Blacks' first five spot, named in the number 10 jersey for the second test against Fiji in Hamilton on Saturday. All Blacks coach Ian Foster says Moonga has the edge over Bowdoin Barrett after the opening two tests of the season. Barrett has copped a couple of knocks and heavy collisions, and Foster says that may have denied his confidence. Took a couple of pretty big head knocks, face knocks, and I thought it just maybe dampened his his desire to go to the line quite as hard as what what, it, what you know he can. And so this is a chance for him to have a little bit of a breather in that space but come on and show us in that second half. There are nine changes to the starting 15 from the first test. Having nearly two weeks in an Olympic isolation bubble has been a blessing in disguise for the New Zealand men's team, according to coach Danny Hay. The Ollie Whites beat Australia 2-0 early this week and have a second and final warm-up match against the Ollie Roos tonight in Ikebara before their tournament opener against Korea next Thursday the culture, the environment that we've created off the pitch and then the work they've done on the training field and really seeing a lot of that come to life in a, in a pretty good way against Aussie first up was for me really exciting. So hopefully we take another couple of steps in the right direction tonight. You know, the players, they're hungry to learn, they're hungry to develop and they're actually really hungry to show people how good they can be. Meanwhile, COVID restrictions mean Olympic winners will have their medals presented on a tray rather than having them hung around their necks. That's the news. Stuck in New South Wales. With New South Wales, it could still be weeks before everybody there has the opportunity to get on a flight to come home. Some of the people may find themselves there for several months. Plans thrown awry. It's all been so smooth sailing up until now when the bubble reopened. Today, it's just come crashing down again. You know, there has been tears. And now Victoria's under a cloud. What is your prediction? Lockdown for Victoria? <laughs> It's a pretty close call. I'm hoping it's no lockdown, but we'll see. More Bubble Trouble Morning Report, weekdays from 6 on RNZ National. Now the short forecast from Met Service to midnight tomorrow. A strong, moist northwesterly flow affects central and southern areas. Warnings and watches are in force for heavy rain and gales. A red warning is in force for Westland and Buller. Northland to Taranaki, also Coromandel, Bay of Plenty, Taupo and Taumaranui. A few showers south of Waitomo, spreading elsewhere tomorrow afternoon, turning to rain about the higher ground later in the day. Taihapi to Wellington, also Gisborne to Wairarapa. Partly cloudy, showers for Kapiti and northern Wellington, turning to rain there tomorrow night. Nelson, Buller and Westland, also Marlborough, Canterbury High Country as well. Rain becoming heavy in the west this evening, elsewhere tomorrow with northerly gales. Expect thunderstorms possible in Westland. For the remainder of Canterbury, also Otago, Southland and Fiordland, mostly cloudy, scattered rain developing tonight, possibly thundery in Fiordland tomorrow morning. For the Chatham Islands, isolated showers, some rain tomorrow morning. RNZ National, it's coming up to eight minutes past five.
Kia ora rā, e ho, tēnā koutou katoa, no mai, haere mai, ki Checkpoint i tēnei rā. You're with Checkpoint, ko Lisa Owen tēnei. Two carjackings and two innocent bystanders with guns held to their heads during a crime fueled rampage through Auckland. What started with a vehicle being stolen from a car yard quickly escalated to a police pursuit of a runaway gunman. It ended in a shootout between officers and the armed man at a busy Auckland intersection. The second significant firearms incident involving police in 24 hours. Kate Gregan has the details. A frightening ordeal, a police chase, gunshots and two members of the public who had a gun held to their heads. It all began at a car dealership in Penrose this morning. Police say a BMW X5 was stolen from Youth Garage on Church Street. Assistant Commissioner Richard Chambers says the Eagle helicopter was nearby and was able to track the vehicle. The driving uh, was uh, very poor, very dangerous and it crashed in the, at the corner of the main highway and Great South Road in Ellerslie. Police staff were very quickly there and as they moved forward to the crashed vehicle they noticed the offending driver holding a firearm to the head of a member of the public. Police fired their first shot at the male offender. With a firearm held to a person's head, he managed to get into the car, a Suzuki Swift, and take off. He ran over the car owner's foot as he fled. A police pursuit followed. Police say the man continued to drive dangerously before crashing again, this time at a main Auckland intersection at Great South Road and South Eastern Highway. As police approached the crashed vehicle again, we saw the offender holding a firearm to the head of a member of the public. My staff were very courageous. They moved forward and they fired a shot, which has injured the offender. A firearm held to the head of a second member of the public, who was able to get away once police fired again. Assistant Commissioner Chambers says the offender was shot in his torso and police moved in to provide first aid. He was taken to Auckland City Hospital, where he is in a serious but stable condition. One witness who saw the incident unfold said he heard two or three shots and that it all happened so fast. One of the ladies was quite hectically scared and uh, Silvica, she jumped out of her car and fell to the ground trying to keep away from the shots. Assistant Commissioner Chambers says the officers did a remarkable job in what was a volatile, high-risk and life-threatening situation. He says it was a horrifying event for the members of the public. Very traumatic situation for those members of the public to find yourself sitting in your car, minding your own business. Next thing you know, uh, you've got a firearm being held to your head uh, and uh, people are you know, someone's trying to steal your car. Very, very traumatic. And for the officers. Today is just another demonstration of the very challenging situations that we find ourselves dealing with, very volatile, very fast moving. And uh, they've done a remarkable job today to take someone who was um, presenting some uh, real risk to uh, members of the community and my staff have moved forward in a very confident way to deal with that situation, put themselves at risk. This was the second shooting involving police in the past 24 hours. A Hamilton man died last night after being shot by officers. They say the man initially fired at officers five times. Police went to the Hillcrest property early in the evening because they had concerns about him. Assistant Commissioner Chambers says officers returned a few hours later and the man arrived in a vehicle and started shooting at them. We responded with fire uh, and he was uh, hit and uh, sadly uh, fatally injured. My colleagues administered first aid straight away, but he did pass away a short time later. Richard Chambers says an officer who was injured after falling and hitting his head is in hospital after undergoing surgery. He says the man was using a high-powered firearm. Homai o Fakaro, I'd love your feedback on that. Noreira anei na kaupapa mo te hotaka nei. Should police be armed on a permanent basis? They have access to weapons and sometimes carry them uh, when a special order is issued. Should they be permanently on their hips? Patuhi mai, text me 2101, tweet us at checkpointrnz or email checkpoint at rnz.co.nz.
There are now active COVID cases in three Australian states and Victoria is poised to enter its fifth lockdown tonight. Australian media are reporting the lockdown will kick in from midnight local time in an attempt to curb the growing COVID outbreak in the state. Mask rules have been tightened in response, which is now linked to 16 cases. With more, here's Charlotte Cook. It's two new cases linked to an AFL game at the MCG that's put officials in Victoria on alert. Most of the 16 total infections in this latest outbreak have been linked to a removal crew who travelled from New South Wales to Victoria. There, they worked at a Melbourne apartment building while infectious. A smaller portion of cases are linked to a family, one of whom visited a supermarket during their 14-day quarantine. Victoria's COVID-19 commander, Jerome Weimar, says more than 6,000 people in the state are currently isolating. This is probably the fastest response we've ever seen to an outbreak that's moving more quickly than we've ever seen here in Victoria or I suspect anywhere else in Australia. Across the border in New South Wales, there are 65 new cases, down from yesterday's 97. But 28 of the new infections were active in the community. And State Premier Gladys Berejiklian says that number needs to be close to zero before restrictions can be eased. And while she expects tomorrow's numbers will be higher, she hopes the infection rate has plateaued. Whilst the case numbers are bouncing around, we are seeing a stabilisation. They are not growing exponentially. That tells us that the settings we have in place are having an impact. So my strongest message to everybody is keep doing what you are doing. Sites of concern are spread right across Sydney. One case under investigation is at a cancer treatment facility in Sydney's inner west. What is certain, the Delta variant is spreading faster than anything seen before. The only place you should go is to get tested and come home and isolate. If you're worried about your health condition and have symptoms, please call a health clinic, your GP or somebody on the phone. Do not present yourself to a pharmacist or a medical centre or a GP clinic if you have symptoms because unfortunately uh, a number of cases that were picked up were people who had the symptoms and went to get medical attention. And restrictions will remain for another week in parts of Queensland, including Greater Brisbane, after the discovery of three new local cases. One is a 12-year-old boy who flew to Brisbane last week after completing quarantine in Sydney. Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk says she understands people's frustration. We won't be able to ease our restrictions in the Greater Brisbane area, and I know people are going to be disappointed by that. I'm disappointed by that, but what we're seeing is that these um, outbreaks are happening across the country. We've seen what's happened in Victoria overnight, so we've just got to get on top of these things quickly. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Scott Morrison's given an update on Australia's vaccine rollout, admitting it's now two months behind schedule, with just 12% of the eligible population fully vaccinated so far. And we'll keep you updated on what happens in Victoria and the implications that that will have on the trans-Tasman bubble. It is a quarter past five. You're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. Kia ora rawatu, mō te whakarungo mai. E hariaki nei, the moment a police officer thought he would die at the hands of a gunman. Hurry up and wait. Thousands of women who had their benefits docked are still waiting for their cases to be reviewed more than two years after the minister ordered MSD to take a second look. The women had up to $28 a week docked from their benefits for failing to name the other parent. There were exemptions to the rule, including cases of sexual assault or the risk of violence, but some women were too scared or uncomfortable to disclose that detail. In April last year, the government scrapped the sanction, but there's a queue of women waiting to see if they'll get any of the deductions back. Kotaku Manuhiri and Nayane call Carmel Sepaloni, the Minister for Social De- Development. Tēnā koe e te minita. Tēnā koe, Lisa. So some of these women have been waiting more than a year, some two years. Is, is that good enough? Oh, you know, look, we made the decision to get rid of Section 192. Uh, a year before we were able to scrap it, we did, uh, oh, I did get MSD to undertake a proactive campaign. Um, out of the 12,000 clients that they uh, were tasked with contacting, they managed to contact 8,595. 8, what happened was that COVID came along then, and then the 20 dedicated case managers who were doing this work needed to be reverted to kind of 
but urgent work. Tai Hall Minister, um, excuse me, but uh, your phone is just, it's not a great line and we want to oh. hear what you've got to say. So I'm just wondering if you could just move around slightly. So sure. you're telling me there's about um, managed contact about 8,500 and then COVID struck, you had 20 caseworkers on it and, sorry, what happened next? Then they had to be redeployed to urgent COVID work, Lisa. Um, so we're in the process of picking that work up. It hasn't been dropped, it had to be paused. Okay, so how many cases have been resolved then? Um, So, as I said, about 8,595. Those were the ones that were proactively contacted. Um, Women were, of course... But did it result in payments? And do you know how many and what value? Yes, I do. Um, The value, not so much, but I do know that around 2,650 had arrears of some sort of, of, of some sort paid to them. Um, and of that, about 2,400 had uh, some Section 70A or Section 192 um, arrears paid to them. But there's still almost 3,000 cases, and those are only the cases from the review you directed. So there are others where women have proactively sought a review this, themselves. So there's thousands who are still and in they, the queue waiting. And they can do that. So they can do that if they... They're not currently on benefit or they haven't been on benefit in the last couple of years, but they think uh, in the past when uh, they were on benefit, if they think that it may have been applied incorrectly, then they can seek a review through their their local uh, MSD office or case manager in that way as well. Is it kind, though, Minister, to make them wait so long for a decision, some a year, some two years? Oh, look, Lisa, I would have liked to have this result you know, straight away, but it's not easy. Uh, and and we didn't just contact them about this. You know, I made it clear to MSD because of the vulnerability of these particular clients, because of the fact that they were having a sanction applied uh, and then potentially in, in more hardship than what you would experience otherwise, I wanted them to make sure that those uh, phone calls and reviews were fulsome. And so they were traversing all of their entitlements, uh, checking in to see that the... Uh, sanction had been applied correctly, um, but also checking in to see that they were getting access to all of their other entitlements as well. So about 2,500 cases where sanctions were not apply, applied appropriately, what does that tell you about well, how MSD is dealing with these cases or dealt with them? Um, it tells us what we already knew, that um, for many of these women, having those kinds of conversations on the front line with case managers is really difficult. Uh, having to disclose sexual violence or uh, physical violence in a relationship or feeling threatened by a former partner is not something that um, all women feel comfortable discussing with a case manager. Uh, and thereby, therefore, you know, in some instances, the sanction was applied incorrectly, not necessarily because the case manager didn't know, uh, but, you know, in many instances, because the woman didn't feel comfortable disclosing that information. So what what is the um, what is required of a woman now? If you're reviewing the case, there's still that issue of disclosure, right? So what level of information is MSD requiring of these women when they talk to them? Yeah, it is a really sensitive conversation. And so the, the 20 case managers who had been originally appointed were experienced case managers um, and you know, had had tr- well traversed what was going to be required in these conversations. I met a number of them as I travelled around the country. Uh, they were very committed to this work as they were undertaking it and found it uh, incredibly fulfilling knowing that they were uh, correcting decisions that may have been wrong, um, having fulsome conversations and finding out the true situation for these women what is- uh, and being able to approve arrears uh, where decisions were wrong or not based on the full and correct information. So what's your instruction to them? Because obviously some of these cases will go back years. There's not necessarily what you may consider to be proof. Are they being instructed where it's a line call, they should believe the woman? Uh, Well, actually, you know, the conversations that I've um, heard via the case managers that were engaged in the work um, seem to have been very fulsome. I'm not the frontline case manager. However, the fact that uh, 2,400 arrears uh, were paid out or approved uh, because the decision was found to have been wrong, I think goes to show that actually they're having very genuine conversations and that, um, you know, uh, from what I can see, the women uh, by and large are 
being able to prove their situation mm. and show where it was incorrect. Minister, we've had a flood of emails since we ran the story that we did about one woman who's waited more than a year for a review. And I just want to share one of them with you. This person was sanctioned for 18 years for not naming their son's dad. She says, I was alone, I was struggling, I wanted to keep my boy and for that I was punished. I felt it was discrimination for all of us who went through that. It's discrimination of the worst form. I couldn't tell them who his dad was. I was gang raped. She doesn't want to share that information now. She didn't want to share that information then. So where are those women left? We still have to base any decision-making retrospectively on what the law was at the time, Lisa. Um, You know, of course, I have every empathy, sympathy for that particular woman and every other woman that's been in this situation. Uh, But NSD does have to have very sensitive um, but very... uh, thorough conversations with the women that are applying for a review and they can't make decisions if they don't have all the information. But I go back to my earlier question, Minister. If it is a line call, has MSPD been instructed to accept the testimony, if you like, of the women? I am not the case manager and I don't give that level of operational advice. But what I do do, Lisa, is set the scene with regards to my expectations around how we treat clients and the way we talk to them. I think the fact that we've had 2,400 uh, approved for arrears payments because it's deemed that the decision was incorrect out of the 8,500 that we have, have managed to make contact with to review their cases uh, goes to show that I think that process is working. As you've said, so, you know, it's not as fast as we would like it to be, uh, but the reality is it's, it's it's a proactive, um, you know, reach out to these women who may have had the wrong decision made on their case. So what do you say to those women? We're almost out of time, but what do you say to those women who are still waiting in the queue for a decision? I say to those that are waiting for a decision, we will work as quickly as we can. Um, that I apologise that COVID slowed us down with this work, but we are picking it back up. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm relieved that we have been able to Uh, get rid of that horrible sanction so that no other women moving forward have to be penalised for the same reason. And very quickly, the 20 caseworkers that were redistributed because of COVID, are they back onto this? They're being reinstated at the moment, so it might not necessarily be the same ones, but this is work that we're picking up and getting ready to resume. Appreciate your time this evening, Minister. That was Carmel Sepuloni, the Minister for Social Development. It is 24 minutes past five. Kia moutono mai. You are listening to Checkpoint on RNZ National. This is where I die. That was the thought that ran through the mind of a police officer shot on a suburban Auckland street last year. David Goldfinch was fired at while his colleague, Constable Matthew Hunt, was shot and killed. Eli Epiha has admitted murdering Hunt, but denies he was attempting to murder Goldfinch when he shot at him. Katie Todd has been at the trial in the High Court in Auckland. Face to face with a man who was pointing a gun at him, finger on the trigger. Constable David Goldfinch has today told the court about the moments before he was shot at by a man who killed his colleague. I'd stopped moving forward and started to kind of walk backwards whilst I was doing that. So maybe there was probably a little over a car length between us. He just pointed the firearm at me. He, he took it from this position here. He took it from across his body. Turned it. Turned it toward you. Yep. And he just started pulling the trigger, firing bullets at me. It was a dark Toyota driving erratically and which had an alert on its number plate that first caught the attention of officers Matthew Hunt and David Goldfinch. They came around the corner of Raynella Drive in Massey into thick smoke and debris at the scene of a crash. Goldfinch told the court a woman was screaming at the top of her lungs. He says he tried to shelter behind a parked SUV and found himself in a game of cat and mouse with the gunman who followed him and seemed to be trying to get a clear shot. He says he yelled at the gunman to stop and remembers a brief and surreal moment. And I saw him just kind of almost like contemplating what I said to him. And then after like a few seconds, he just kind of went, like his head just kind of clipped. Like he just kind of, and it was like he just made a decision. And it was just like, I'm going to kill you. Goldfinch says the gun flashed. He saw an explosion of shrapnel, felt heat on his arms and hair and thought, this is where I die. He wasn't sure how that bullet missed, but the next one didn't. The ground was exploding, like the grass and the concrete, and then I felt one into my hip. A bullet hit me straight in the hip, and it just felt like an explosion of acid through my belt. And then, very quick succession, it was just hip, and then my leg and my calf muscle. 
There's been little in the way of emotional reactions from Eli Epiha in court throughout four days of witness statements. But today he repeatedly shook his head as Goldfinch claimed the gun and the shots were fired directly at him. Goldfinch says the bullets didn't stop as he ran, eventually taking shelter behind a house, kneeling over and seeing his pants blown apart with holes in his leg. He says a loud noise from his radio drew the attention of the gunman, who turned as if he was going to come after Goldfinch again. He says he fled once more, scaling a fence and sheltering with a resident, until finally help arrived. And then all of a sudden I just saw one of my colleagues come over the hill with a rifle, and then once I saw one I saw 20 police officers, and I just, just collapsed. Goldfinch was taken to hospital and says he's still recovering from the three bullet wounds and shrapnel that had to be surgically removed. Earlier today, the court heard from a bystander to the shooting who described the moment her husband was struck in the crash and she lay on top of him, praying they wouldn't be shot. The trial before Justice Venning and a jury is set down for three weeks. The Fiji rugby coach believes they've reached a balanced compromise over the team's playing jerseys for this weekend. The side pulled the pin on wearing jerseys with Vaccinate Fiji emblazoned on the chest for last weekend's test against the All Blacks. This week, they've agreed to a slightly tweaked version. Vinnie Wiley reports from Hamilton. When the Fiji team lines up for the national anthem in Hamilton this weekend, their shirts will read Vaccinate Fiji and the words, It's Your Choice. Fiji coach Vern Cotter says the jersey idea was sprung on the players at late notice last week without enough consultation. That conversation has now taken place. It was important to be able to have a discussion and, and make it a democratic choice and that's what happened and it happened early in the week. You know, we wanted it done and dusted early on and it was done and dusted Monday and now we're just focusing on, on the game and that's, you know, there, there, there's a clear message there. But not all the players agree with the decision to vaccinate. So a compromise was reached. There's a, the vaccinate message and then it obviously some, not everybody agrees in getting vaccinated so the, your choice on the jersey certainly makes that very clear. So we're, we're aware of the plight, everybody's aware of the plight of Fiji at the moment and sympathise and you know that's the stance that everybody's taken. We feel it's a balanced, well-balanced stance and hopefully you know, all, we do, all we need to do now is just focus on the game. Fiji is being hit hard by COVID-19 with close to 10,000 active cases in isolation and 69 reported deaths. The vast majority of them recorded since the latest outbreak began in April. However, vaccine hesitancy remains staunch in pockets of Fiji and the government last week announced tough penalties in order to compel public servants to get vaccinated or lose their jobs. The president of the Fiji Society in Hamilton, Samasoni Tikoi Nassau, was a keen observer at Fiji's training run in Hamilton this morning. He says there are differing views in the community about whether to get vaccinated or not. Uh, in the islands, uh, with uh, sickness in general, you know, there's always other ways that they look at to try and uh, uh, counter uh, sickness. But on this scale, with this pandemic, I think the message is getting to them slowly that they should get vaccinated. Savaira Vuendrakete was watching Fiji train today with three of her four children. The clinical nurse specialist is fully vaccinated and was until recently one of the COVID-19 vaccinators working in the Hamilton area. I'm a firm believer of um, that it works, that uh, together if we do vaccinate we'll be able to battle this thing out together, COVID-19. Um, um, and I understand why people have concerns around you know, the vaccination itself, so just encouraging families if you have concerns to seek professionals. England-based hooker Sam Matavesi has already had his first dose of a COVID vaccine but supports the decision for others to make up their own mind. At the end of the day, we play rugby, we're not politicians, we're not doctors, you know, we, we don't m make the medicine, so I think everyone has, has to have their own choice of, of, of what they want to do. With the jersey issue settled, the Fiji side is solely focused on their encounter against the All Blacks on Saturday. Iwi e hairiaki nei e our checkpoint. Benefits are down, but some regions still have unemployment rates almost twice the national average. Could drones take over from people hand planting trees? And pop star Britney Spears gets a tiny taste of freedom. Homai or Fakaro, we'd love to hear from you about anything you've heard on the program this evening. Patui mai. 
Text me, 2101 is the number. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ or email checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. It is time for the headlines now. So, ko Susana anō tēnei. Kia ora, Lisa. The police say today's shooting at a busy Auckland intersection threatened the lives of two members of the public. Both were briefly held at gunpoint by a man who carjacked one and attempted to carjack a second before being shot by police. The arrested gunman is in hospital in a stable condition. The police in Hamilton say they did their best to take a man into custody before he was fatally shot in the suburb of Hillcrest last night. They say the man fired at least five shots at them before officers returned fire. Across the Tasman, Melbourne is likely to go into lockdown tonight for the fifth time. Victoria recorded another two cases today, bringing the number of cases in the latest COVID outbreak to 16. A police officer, wounded moments before the fatal shooting of Matthew Hunt, last year says the gunman was also trying to kill him. Eli Epiha admits the murder of Mr Hunt in the Auckland suburb of Massey but has denied the attempted murder of Officer David Goldfinch. On day four of the trial in the High Court at Auckland, Mr Goldfinch recounted seeing the gunman stop and think before aiming the gun at him and firing. A fisheries expert is warning more foreign flagged vessels could seek harbour in New Zealand after two Spanish flagged vessels were allowed to dock. The player Zahara is on its way to Littleton after 16 crew tested positive, while another 16 sailors from the Viking Bay are isolating in a Wellington MIQ facility. Glenn Simmons says there are several thousand similar Spanish flagged vessels crewed by Indonesian nationals fishing for tuna in the Pacific. The largest shipment yet of the Pfizer vaccine has arrived here with about 180,000 doses, part of the total 1 million due to arrive during July. The COVID-19 response minister Chris Hipkins says a stockpile will be rebuilt as the larger shipments turn up. An official apology for the 1970s dawn raids has been rescheduled for August the 1st after being postponed due to the alert level changes in Wellington. The event will take place at the Auckland Town Hall with other meetings to follow. Those are the latest news headlines from RNZ National. Our next news and weather update is at six. Nā mihi susana. No mai hoki mai. If you're just joining us, this is Checkpoint. Ko Lisa Owen tēnei. Ko taku hoa in Nāianē ko Nona Pouncie, who is in the studio to talk business. All right, let's look at ah inflation, second quarter inflation data tomorrow. Now, what are we expecting to see in that? Well, we're expecting to see the highest inflation rate in about a decade. Mm. That's a showstop on Nona. There you go. Well, it's Why? almost a sh- Well, yeah. because um, we've seen a number of things happening with supply chain issues, raising uh, shipping costs and so on. We've seen that. Uh, and we've also been talking quite a lot about uh, labour market uh, supply shortages as well. So skill shortages, demand on wages, that kind of thing. So what's going to happen is we're going to look at these numbers tomorrow. We're expecting um, a quarterly rise of about 0.8%. That's going to translate into something like 2.8. Some are forecasting 2.9%. That's above the RBNZ, the Reserve Bank's uh, target range of, of, of 1 to 3, so 2%, right? Now, you might think, oh, the Reserve Bank is going to act quickly on this. Not necessarily. And that's because there is a view that a lot of this inflation is like one-time increases that will moderate over time. The worry is, is whether or not these costs become entrenched. A lot of economists are saying, yes, they are becoming entrenched. We haven't heard yet from the Reserve Bank, but we do know that they've stopped buying bonds. That's an indication that interest rates are definitely on the way up. For example, the uh, ASB Bank yesterday, um, they changed their interest rate structure. They're going to raise some rates. They're going to pay depositors more money, uh, more interest on their savings. And Nick Tuffley is believing, and a number of economists are coming on board with this, that uh, interest rates could move next month when the Reserve Bank uh, reviews it again, and then another increase in November. So it could happen much sooner than later, but a lot of that depends on what labour market data says in a couple weeks' time. Okay, let's move on to this thing called overtime. It is apparently up 29% in the workplace. First off, what's overtime these days? And, and you know, what's driving, where does that number come from? Well, there's a standard work week, which most of us might, well, I guess your standard work week might be different from mine, but let's say it's 40 hours. This would be over and above that. And uh, what's happened is Hayes, which is a recruitment firm, did a survey of 600 employers in organisations 
organizations rather in New Zealand and found that 29% had workers uh, that were working more time than than standard and that 51% of them weren't being paid for it. That was going to be my next question. So more than half of the people who are doing overtime hours are getting no money Nothing. for it. No, they're getting no pay. And uh, this is a big issue because in one case, well, 3% of the organizations that were surveyed at the worst end, over 21% of additional hours over a standard week these people were working. Like, that's a lot of extra overtime. And then it becomes an issue of health and safety, uh, mental and physical well-being. And one of the drivers of it, believe it or not, are flexible work hours. So people go home and they start working maybe a little earlier Then they get you know, the kids off to school or whatever they're doing. And then they, oh, well, they got more work to do, so they, they don't even keep track of how much work they're doing. And this is one of the issues. The other one is that it's a labor market shortage and there are skill shortages, so people are having to fill in the gaps. It's not sustainable, that's for sure. Really interesting. Okay, let's take a whiz around the markets. Oh, interesting. So we actually featured in some of the big global market reports because uh, we've moved more uh, quickly on uh, monetary policy with the Reserve Bank stopping with the bond mm-hmm. buying. Canada is going to follow suit. The United States are watching. And so that drove up our dollar. We uh, we were up oh, about 70.4 cents yesterday. We're at 70.1. That's still higher than where we were most recently. Uh, U.S. cents a tad, just a tad under 94 cents at uh, 93.97 uh, Australian and 50.7 pence. Now, our market uh, fell 0.4%. You'd expect that with the um, the specter of raising of higher interest rates. Mm. And that was a 49-point drop to 12,671. That's it. Thanks, Nona. Nona Peltier with Business. And I'm interested in that. Are you working overtime? Let us know uh, how many hours and do you get paid for it. Uh, text us on 2101 or tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. The government's counting another drop in unemployment numbers as a win, but others say they don't paint the whole picture. Over the past three months, more than 31,000 people found jobs and got off the benefit. It's the second highest number of people finding work since records began. Anai te kai and Nita Blake Person. It's a little over a year since COVID ground the economy to a halt and benefit numbers skyrocketed. But as businesses bounce back, so too has the job market. Figures from the Ministry for Social Development over the past three months show around 190,000 people on the job seeker benefit, 6.1% of the working age population. There's been a 10% decrease in people receiving the work ready job seeker benefit from June last year to June 2021. Canterbury man Mark lost his job just before the the pandemic hit and spent nearly a year unemployed. I finally uh, got an interview at a truck driving place that they actually don't mind older people. They're liking the older people because they're more reliable, more stable. Yeah, I I got taken on there as a trial and um, yeah, I haven't left yet. About 31,000 people got off the benefit in the three months to June because they'd found a job. Nearly 10,000 of those had been on the benefit for more than a year. Mark isn't included in those numbers because his wife earns too much for him to access the job seeker benefit. He's not convinced today's figures tell the whole story. I couldn't get any sort of benefit, any sort of help at all, and there were so many people. Once you know you identified as that, so many people say, oh, well, yeah, I'm in the same boat, you know, I can't, can't get any help, can't go on a job seeker. Can't. And that's where they were. the government was hiding a lot of their figures because a lot of the people couldn't get any help. The East Coast was the region with the biggest change in job seeker numbers, a seemingly small 0.6% shift, but it's being noticed on the ground by Linda Markey, the general manager of Gisborne's Moniora, the local budgeting service. Yeah, we're seeing a lot more uh, people coming in the door who are working. They're still um, having trouble with their, their budgeting. They're more likely to come in, and we're seeing a lot of later appointments, of course, because people are working. But she says the jobs often aren't enough for rising costs. We're seeing people who have had a change in their income or um, perhaps the living expenses have gone up, like rents have gone up and things like that, and they're not coping with um, making their money stretch. Northland remains the region with the highest unemployment rate, 10.5%, compared to the southern region on 4.2%. Ricky Houghton is the chief executive of He Korowai Trust in Kaitaia. He says unemployment won't come until the government gives the regions a boost. The government contracts need to be 
partition out into the regions so the regions can have a fighting chance. But when you have a contract sort of tendered nationally, the regions miss out. We can't work our magic at a very local level in a very local way. Overall, the number of people on the benefit remains above pre-pandemic levels. National Social Development spokesperson Louise Upston says that's because the government's failed to create the jobs it promised, with 70,000 more people receiving an unemployment benefit than in 2017. What we're seeing is a continued failure of Labor to deliver jobs who really need them the most. And it's just unfortunate because it means there's a much larger number of job seekers who continue to do it tough out there. All up, there are just over 354,000 people on a benefit and the government says any business looking for workers should get in touch with MSD. Crime-fighting algorithms that sound like the stuff of a Hollywood sci-fi are in the sights of police. A new stock take out today shows they wanted to use one when pulling over drivers, but have now quickly dumped the controversial idea. Ane te kairi poata, a Phil Pennington. The police commissioned a report that identifies 22 algorithms and assesses 10 of the riskiest ones. Well, nine, now that the police today revealed they've dumped the roadside one after independent experts warned against its predictive policing power. It did get to the early development stage, aimed at forecasting a driver's likelihood of getting into serious trouble on the road over the next three years. Professor Colin Gavigan is on an independent police tech oversight panel that helped put the kibosh on that algorithm. I know that the panel were very concerned about that one. So if the information that's informing that decision about future offending is based on previous policing decisions, then you've got a problem of just reinforcing these kind of biased ways of thinking, prejudiced ways of thinking. The algorithms include one that helps compile a daily list of the top five highest risk offenders who are on the loose, another that gauges the chances of a family violence perpetrator re-offending within two years, and that is called up on an officer's phone at a crime scene, and another algorithm that helps assess if a run-of-the-mill crime is even solvable. Gavigan reviewed the report and says it's useful to get this first ever look in on the inside of the crime-fighting tools, but that there aren't enough details about the algorithms or about how police intend to fix the many gaps around safeguarding the public. The report repeatedly mentions the risks of algorithms reinforcing unintended biases and suggests ways to fix that. But nowhere does it make the threat of racial bias or against Māori explicit. That gap strikes Gavigan as a major shortcoming and disturbs Karatiana Tayuru, who has a doctorate in data collection. It's well documented by other scholars and researchers that there are biases in the New Zealand police. So now we have all these algorithms that are using data from biased police and biased incidents, and those systems and algorithms are now deciding who is potentially at risk. The report's released today as part of a push by police to get public buy-in to their growing use of high-tech and potentially invasive tools. They also today put out a 53-page technology stock take. Their Deputy Chief Executive Insights and Deployment, Mark Evans, says the report should reassure people. The use of algorithms by uh, New Zealand police is pretty limited and that most of the algorithms that we use um, are uh, simple by... um, comparison to some others that exist and importantly I think all of them um, enjoy uh, human oversight so we don't have automated decision making through algorithms. The report and Gavigan's panel point out big gaps remain around proper monitoring and governance controls on algorithms but Evans says as soon as they got this report last month they began fixing that. As and when we decide to use additional technology in this way, we will have a robust system including governance and consultation so that we can appropriately balance the operational need with the privacy, ethical and public interest. The catalyst for today's report was police signing up to the National Algorithm Charter last year and wanting to make sure they weren't in breach of it. But some of their algorithms, such as one that ranks youth offenders' chances of being re-arrested, have been used for a long time. Tauru again. If the police had these algorithms before signing up to the Algorithm Charter, perhaps they shouldn't have signed up until they ensured there was no bias and made sure that there was true and proper TTC consultation. He's even more worried after reading this report about police bias increasing, but he's also reassured that its release shows police want to fix things.
Mark Evans says work is well underway aimed at improving consultation with Māori. And Professor Gavigan says that's vital and that the panel will be pressing police to prove they are engaging Māori early and widely as algorithms get ever more powerful. It is 13 minutes to 6. I'm Lisa Owen and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. He muriaki na pitipiti kōrero after the news at 6, the 111 call from a slammed St John ambulance service. An Indigenous woman says her experience in the forced residential school system for Indigenous people in Canada made her ashamed to be brown. Geraldine Shingus says she's cried every day since the first discovery of more than 1,600 unmarked and undocumented graves at the schools, which were mostly run by the Catholic Church and forced the assimilation of Indigenous people. World Watch's Max Toll has this report. The aim of the school was to take the Indian out of the child. At the Muscaugan Indian Residential School in the 1960s, Geraldine Shingus was regularly beaten, whether by a strap, a ruler or slaps to her face, all punishment for simply speaking her native language. She was forced at the Catholic school in Saskatchewan to speak only English and to learn Latin. She says she and her parents were considered savages and dirty Indians. When I came out of school after nine years, the impact on me was I had really low self-esteem. I was ashamed to be Indigenous. I was ashamed to be... uh, I didn't want to be brown. You can't do that to children take them away from their parents. And then um, I experienced also um, uh, sexual abuse, which I have a hard time talking about. I, I never talk about that. Geraldine Shingus has lived with that shame for many years, but more recently has reconnected with her native culture. Her spirit names are Sky Woman and Northern Lights Woman. She comes from the Bear Clan. And the discovery of unmarked and undocumented graves at school sites has reinforced that determination. Indigenous leaders expect many more graves of children will be found as investigations continue. I see, like, my circle is, uh, I have allies, uh, non-Indigenous to white people that are supportive. But also you have individuals that um, say that the residential schools um, had good intentions and like you know get over it and maybe these children had illnesses and they died and they're taking away they're minimizing the the residential school experience there is a national soul searching in canada regarding its legacy of residential schools and the treatment of indigenous people the prime minister justin trudeau offered this apology in 2017 saying that we are sorry today is not enough. It will not erase the loneliness you have felt. It will not undo the harm you have suffered. It will not bring back the languages and traditions that you have lost. Geraldine Shingus wants accountability. The justice that I'm seeking is uh, I'm asking that the Catholic Church be held responsible and be accountable. Before I was asking for an apology, I I don't want an apology. Now I want them to be um, charged. There's criminal charges that need to be laid. And also for the federal government to be held accountable because they they implemented the schools. In 2015, a commission reported more than 4,000 Indigenous children in residential schools in Canada died from neglect or abuse. For many, their remains and experiences are only now coming to light. The future of council-owned housing in Napier is in limbo as the city grapples one of one of the worst social housing crises in the country. The city council says although they expect demand to keep growing, the houses they own aren't in a good shape and they may have to sell them. Anai te kairi poata, a Tom Kitchen, a Ahuriri. With neatly presented gardens and a big green gathering space in the centre, This resident is happy to be living in this council housing complex in central Napier. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's excellent. That's despite the council admitting it's doing the bare necessities of work because of its dwindling funds and its housing accounts. 
Now the council's eyeing up their options for the houses, and he's worried it'll end up like the Kainga Ora flats just down the road, with rubbish strewn across the front of the property. We've got a recycle thing here they put in, the council have put in, you know, so we, we, we've got used to how to recycle the stuff but down there, they're just throwing everything in the rubbish bags out in the thing, and then they come and clean up once a month. Napier's facing the highest social housing waitlist per capita in the country. But the council's own portfolio is in turmoil. It says its units are ageing and it's costing more and more to maintain them. So what will the future bring? Options include transferring the entire portfolio to another entity, like a community housing provider, or selling some. In a recent submission to the council, the local district health board spoke out strongly against this. The Health Board do not support Council's consideration of a reduction in Council-owned affordable housing stock in response to unsustainable costs, particularly while there is a deficit in affordable housing in Napier City. The Health Board points to places like Queenstown Lakes as examples of where it's working well. Maxine Bogue, the Napier City Councillor responsible for housing, says the new Healthy Home Standards has piled up costs. It's left us in a situation where because we don't charge full market rent, it's subsidised rent. Clients, our tenants spend no more than 30% of their income on their rent. Um, we've got a shortfall in terms of making this sustainable. And the council can't do it all. I think there's a limited amount that we can do. Um, the, we are very concerned about the housing crisis. We don't have large tracts of land that we can um, build on or get other people to build on. But the council's chatting to Kainga Order. They're very aware of the pressing need for social housing in and around Napier. Got far too many people living in motels, which is not a good situation, particularly for families and for children. The council will make a decision on its housing stock in the next 12 months. As for the residents who's proud of his home, He's just hoping there won't be dozens of rubbish bags piling up on the streets in Nahuriri any time soon. A judge has granted Britney Spears the right to hire her own lawyer. And there were further hearings on the pop star's controversial conservatorship. She broke down in tears at the news, saying she was extremely scared of her father and his influence over her. CNN's Stephanie Elam has this report. Britney Spears is... One step closer to potentially taking back control of her life. Judge Brenda Penny granted the singer's request to choose her own lawyer. Wasting no time, former federal prosecutor Matthew Rosengart was in court on behalf of Spears. We feel that today was a big step in the interest of justice. Judge Penny accepted the resignations of both Samuel Ingham, Spears' court-appointed lawyer since 2008, and Bessemer Trust, a wealth management firm and the court-appointed co-conservator of her estimated $60 million estate. Calling into court, Spears was emotional, sobbing as she spoke for about 20 minutes, saying she wants to get her father, Jamie Spears, removed from the arrangement and charged with conservatorship abuse, saying, quote, if this is an abuse, I don't know what is. She added, I thought they were trying to kill me. Her new lawyer echoing some of her sentiments. Pursuant to Britney Spears' instructions, we will be moving promptly and aggressively for his removal. The question remains, why is he involved? He should step down voluntarily, as that is in the best interest of Britney Spears. The last time Spears spoke in court about three weeks ago, she railed against the conservatorship, calling it abusive, demoralizing, and embarrassing. She also claimed she was forced to perform, take medication, including birth control, and get therapy. Hey, hey, ho, ho. conservatorship has got to go. Her fans have intensified their calls to free Britney from what they deem a toxic situation, gathering outside the courthouse as news spread of Spears' victory. Before the hearing, Spears gained some key support, too. Her mother, Lynn Spears, said in court filings that Britney is able to care for herself and is in a much different place than when the conservatorship began in 2008. Hi, Brittany. That's when multiple health and psychiatric issues landed Spears in the hospital that January. Her father maintains he's acted in the best interest of his daughter. But critics of the arrangement argue that if Britney can work, then she can also handle her own affairs. What's up, Vegas? And in recent years, she's kept busy, releasing several albums, headlining her Las Vegas residency. 
and serving as a reality competition judge, all while under the conservatorship and has her mother's petition states earning, quote, literally hundreds of millions of dollars as an international celebrity. As for Jody Montgomery, the temporary conservator of Spears' person, Brittany said she wants Montgomery to help her transition into the real world. A drone dropping thousands of seed pods over the Hanua Ranges could make planting trees by hand a thing of the past. If the trial works, New Zealand could be progressing on our goal of one billion trees by 2028, years earlier. Our reporter Louise Tanuth and cameraman Nick Munro were there for its launch. Soaring through the skies, this large drone could be the new way forward for planting native trees here in the Hanua Ranges. For the last three years, native plants have been slowly planted by hand in the former pine forest. It's one of the biggest reforestation projects and the drone method could be a game changer. 5,000 seed pods are loaded at a time and then scattered over a one acre testing section from the year. Sam Vai from Invoco Technologies is the brains behind it all. He explains why it's much better than planting by hand. The traditional methods of going around and planting uh, a seedling every few square metres is great, but it's extremely slow. And, it, and New Zealand um, landscape is, is pretty, has pretty steep terrain, so any method that we can do by air that improves the speed, improves the efficiencies um, and reduces the cost. Dropping seeds alone had little success, so seed pods were dreamt up. We were getting really poor take, real poor germination. So we came up with the idea of actually encapsulating the, uh, the seed within an organic mixture and putting those into a pod. The pods weigh about two grams in size and they're about the size of a lolly. They contain five to six different native seeds which have been taken from the area. These are then mixed with water, clay and compost, which is compressed down into this. I reckon probably go the same mission, same flight mission. We'll go probably a slightly lower altitude um, and keep the, keep the soft width, keep the same mission, and go again. Today there's been 10 drone flights, spreading 50,000 pods in just half an hour. But not only is it time savvy, it'll save on cash too. We think we would be, per hectare, we would be probably under $1,000 per hectare in a commercial operation. That's compared to about ten to 20000 per hectare by hand. The forest surrounds the dam catchment that supplies a lot of Auckland's water. Operations controller at Watercare, James Talbot, explains now native trees are being planted instead of pine trees being harvested. It's a big benefit. There's some implications to the land with that harvesting, um, particularly in steeper areas of the catchment where you get exposed soils um, that can potentially wash into the dams. RNZ News at 6. Nga mihi nui ko Susana Leata with DNA. A senior police officer says two shootings in the last 24 hours have been traumatic. In Auckland today, two men of the public were, members of the public were briefly held at gunpoint by a man in a stolen car. He then carjacked a driver before attempting to take a vehicle from a second person. He was injured when police shot him. In Hamilton, a man died last night after being shot by officers. The man initially fired five times using a high-powered weapon. Assistant Commissioner Richard Chambers says the incidents are difficult for those involved, including the police. A situation such as this, uh, and also in Hamilton last night, are, are traumatic for us too, and uh, they, um, they, these incidents affect us all in different ways. The offender shot in Auckland is in hospital in a serious but stable condition. The Social Development Minister is apologising for delays in repaying women whose benefits were docked because they wouldn't name the father of their children. Up to $28 a week was taken off some women, and while the government scrapped the sanction last year, thousands are waiting to be refunded. Carmel Sepuloni told Checkpoint that one difficulty is that 20 case staff who were working on the issue were redeployed because of COVID-19. I say to those that are waiting for a decision, we will work as quickly as we can. Um, that I apologise that COVID slowed us down with this work, but we are picking it back up. And, you know, I'm, I'm relieved that we have been able to uh, get rid of that horrible sanction so that no other women moving forward have to be penalised for the same reason.
Carmel Sepuloni says the caseworkers are in the process of being reinstated. A Northland community leader says the government needs to give more contracts to the regions to boost employment. The latest figures show about 31,000 people got off the benefit in the three months to June because they'd found a job. Just over 6% of the working age population was on the job seeker benefit, but that number was 10.5% in Northland. The chief executive of Hare Korowai Trust in Kaitaia, Ricky Horton, says the region needs a boost. The government contracts need to be partitioned out into the regions so the regions can have a fighting chance. But when you have a contract sort of tendered nationally, the regions miss out. We can't work our magic at a very local level in a very local way. Ricky Horton says more people are moving back to Northland from urban centres, which is adding to job pressures. Customs is working with the agents of the Spanish-flagged vessel Playa Zahara to make sure it poses no risks to public health. The fishing boat is making its way to Littleton Port and is expected to arrive tomorrow. 16 of the 18 crew aboard have tested positive for COVID-19. A customs spokesperson says an all-of-government response has been activated to ensure the vessel is received in a safe and coordinated way. They say the process is expected to carry a very low risk. In Wellington, 16 crew from the Viking Bay are isolating in an MIQ facility with the Delta variant of COVID-19. Napier's Council says it may have to sell off some of its community housing stock because they're too expensive to maintain. It comes as a city faces one of the worst emergency housing crises in the country. Our Hawke's Bay reporter Tom Kitchen has more. The Napier City Council owns nearly 400 flats across the city, some for low-income people and others for retirees. The council admits it's doing the bare minimum of work to the buildings because of dwindling funds in its housing accounts. It says it might have to sell some or transfer the entire portfolio to another entity such as a community housing provider. However, the Hawke's Bay District Health Board doesn't support this, especially when there's a deficit of affordable housing in the city. The Department of Conservation is preparing to possibly transfer the baby orca stranded north of Wellington into a portable pool to protect the calf from heavy swells. The calf has been with rescuers at Plymouth and Harbour since Sunday, but the search for his pod today has been hampered by bad weather. Docks Marine Species Manager Ian Angus says if the transfer goes ahead, the orca will be closely monitored. You know, we'll have vets on site, we'll do an assessment um, at the time. You know, it's a tough call and a difficult call to make that we'd prefer to avoid if we could, but weather's dictating otherwise. And then we'll just make, um, make a transfer of the orca from the current pen you know, carefully monitoring its health and place it into the pool and then monitor its health beyond that. Ian Angus says putting the calf into the portable pool would also protect the volunteers. It's coming up to five minutes past six. The return of All Blacks captain Sam Kane is still some way off, with coach Ian Foster not expecting him back until late September at the earliest. Kane has missed the All Blacks test against Tonga and Fiji after suffering a chest injury playing for the Chiefs in Super Rugby Aotearoa and Foster says that won't be they won't be rushing him back. I can't see him being around for the rugby championship and if he is available at the end then there's probably a, a chance we'll put him into NPC for a game or two. Sam Whitelock will lead the side against Fiji and Hamilton this weekend, with Ian Foster having made nine changes to the starting 15 from last week's test in Dunedin. Ryan Fox will be disappointed if he can't achieve another top 20 finish at the British Golf Open. Fox tees off at Royal St George tonight. It's his fifth Open. He finished tied for 16th when the tournament was last held in 2019. While he hasn't played the Kent course before, Fox says he's always enjoyed Lynx courses. You've got to deal with the conditions as well, generally a bit of wind. I think our forecast is actually pretty good this week though, so we might not have too much of that, but I've always enjoyed that style of golf, the creativity involved, so hopefully it, you know, that puts me in good stead for this week as well. The Milwaukee Bucks have beaten the Phoenix Suns 109-103 to in Game 4 of the NBA Finals to level the best of seven series at two games all. And New Zealand's oldest Olympian and the last surviving member of the 1948 London Olympic team, swimmer Nairi Galloway, has died. She was 95. That's the news. Tonight on Nights, our overseas correspondent Rima Bass is on the line from Sudan. Claire Kincannon goes to Songbird School during our changing world. Turns out the males are getting too much credit. And then there's the world's weather with Eric Brenstrom. 
record-breaking heat in North America. He also wants to talk about the Great London Fog of 1952 on nights with me, Brian Crump, after the news at 7 on RNZ National. Now the short forecast from meat service to midnight. Tomorrow, a strong, moist northwesterly flow affects central and southern areas. Warnings and watches are in force for heavy rain and gales. A red warning is in force for Westland and Buller. Northland to Taranaki, also Coromandel, Bay of Plenty, Taupo and Taumaranui. A few showers south of Waitomo, spreading elsewhere tomorrow afternoon, turning to rain about the higher ground later in the day. Tai Hapi to Wellington, also Gisborne to Wairarapa, partly cloudy. Showers for Kapiti and northern Wellington, turning to rain there tomorrow night. Nelson, Buller, Westland, Marlborough, Canterbury... High country. Rain becoming heavy in the west this evening, elsewhere tomorrow with northerly gales. Thunderstorms are possible in Westland. For the remainder of Canterbury, also Otago, Southland and Fiordland, mostly cloudy. Scattered rain developing tonight, possibly thundery in Fiordland tomorrow morning. Chatham Islands, isolated showers, some rain tomorrow morning. RNZ National, it's coming up to eight minutes past six. Thanks, Susana. No mai hoki mai. You're listening to Checkpoint. Ko Lisa Owen tēnei. It's a code black for St John Ambulance with the service at peak capacity. Respiratory illnesses and sicknesses in its own ranks is piling the pressure on too. Last week alone, there was an 11% jump in 111 calls and a 7% increase in ambulance responses. That's compared to what's expected during these winter months. Dan O's, St John Deputy Chief Executive Ambulance Operations, says they've had to stand up a special emergency command centre to deal with the demand. So basically you are absolutely slammed right now. Um, Absolutely, that's basically a good way to describe it. And kind of if you had a system or alert system, where are you at on that alert system in terms of the demand? So we talk about um, we talk about what we call um, REAP levels, so Resource Escalation Action Plan levels, um, and that's a five tier system. Um, one represents business as usual, and five represents system failure. Um, at the moment, we're at REAP level four, which re- um, represents um, extreme pressure on the system, um, and so we're not at risk of system failure, um, but we are at extreme pressure, um, and that extreme pressure is to, um, is driven by two things. One is very very high demand from the public for our services Um, and the second thing is very high sickness amongst our staff which of course is reflected by the sickness in the public at the moment. So when you say sickness among your staff is it any particular thing? Uh, um, Nothing in particular that we're aware of we're just aware that for example our communication centre has experienced um, sickness up around 14%, which is really high for them. Um, And we know that our staff are vulnerable to the same illness that the public are. Um, And, of course, it's school holidays. So if you've got a child that's got RSV or a respiratory illness, um, you know, you can't send that child to daycare. And our paramedics, you know, their parents are the same as everyone else's. um, So they're needing to stay home and care for their dependents, just like the people in the community. I know you're all doing your best, but what does this mean for wait times? Can I give you a scenario? Let's say I've badly broken my ankle and I dial 111. What are the prospects of me getting picked up and and what time frame? Sure. Um, So if it's a life-threatening emergency, you can expect the same response from St John that you would expect any other time of year. So at the moment, if you've got a life-threatening emergency on average, we're getting to you within 10 minutes. Um, And so that's um, nationwide. Um, Now, if it's not a life-threatening emergency, um, and so um, uh, perhaps not a broken ankle, because obviously you're in a a lot of pain, so that would be at the top end of our emergencies, which aren't life-threatening. But if it was a sprained um, ankle, for example, um, people can expect to see wait times um, up around two or three hours at times for that sort of incident. Um, And again, if it's that sort of emergency, what we would say to you, um, if you're able to deal um, uh, with that case um, through your GP, please do so. Um, but please understand that um, you know if it's not a life-threatening emergency, there may be longer wait times. Um, so we'd ask that people um, make patients um, as comfortable as they can if there is a long wait time. And obviously, if there's any concerns, they can always call triple one. Um, uh, they can talk to our call handlers. They can talk to our paramedics, and we'll make sure we give you the safest response we can. But we do acknowledge um, that it's not the ideal response that New, that New Zealanders would always expect from us, but we. We are confident um, that we will um, provide a safe response, even though it's not as convenient as it might normally be. Any areas that are worse than others? 
Yeah, so particularly Auckland, um, Waikato and Christchurch have experienced very, very high demand. Um, and so um, those are areas which um, have been an area, have been um, areas we've been focused on. Um, we have established an emergency operations centre. And to give you um, a sense of um, what that means for us, so that's something that we would normally establish um, when there's a major incident. So, for example, the mosque attacks, for example, the earthquakes, for example, for Cardi, are examples of times that we'd normally set up an emergency operations centre. So we normally do um, do that um, in response to excessive demand from a single incident. Right now we're doing that because we've got global increases in demand that are far higher than what we would experience. Now, the advantage of the emergency operations centre is the additional resource um, with additional um, real-time information to enable us to make good decisions. And it also means that we would mo- we can move resource around um, in between departments and in, de- in between areas as well. Um, so a great example today in Christchurch. Um, so in Christchurch, we have um, additional ambulances on today due to high sickness. Um, and those resource- um, ambulance resources have come from as far away as Timaru. I know people don't like this phrase in in the health system, but essentially this emergency operations centre is about rationing and prioritising, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. This is making sure the people with the highest need get the quickest response. So in terms of staff, is there any way you can bring more staff on or have you got issues getting paramedics at the experience level that you need? So um, uh, right now um, we've got we're using our what we would call our reserves. So we have casual personnel, we have personnel who work in offices, etc., um, and they're backfilling illness. Um, uh, right now, as you'll be aware, in Budget 21, with the support of the government, um, we've uh, been able to announce that we'll be appointing 98 additional ambulance personnel. Um, they take time to stand up, so you know, 100 additional staff is quite significant for us, um, and we would hope we would have all those in place um, by the end of March. Um, and we're able to do that by both employing New Zealand graduates from paramedic programs, um, but also by training some staff internally as well. So you're basically, you're in the eye of a storm, right? You're at level four on a scale of five being absolute, as you say, collapse of the system, unable to cope. What pushes you over from four to five? Oh, um, that's a really good question. So I think firstly I would reassure the public that we're doing everything to ensure that we don't do that, um, but uh, that that doesn't happen. Um, but look, what I would say is that the biggest help for us right now is that people make really good decisions about when to call an ambulance. So look, if it's an emergency, by all means call triple one. If you think it's a problem that would normally dealt, be dealt with um, by your GP, please go through there. And if you're seeking health advice, um, please call Healthline. Dan O's St John Deputy Chief Executive Ambulance Operations there. A multi-billion dollar sweetener hasn't got mayors rushing to sign up to the government's three waters reforms. The government's announced a $2.5 billion fund to get local councils on board with major plans to take away their control of water infrastructure. Here's political reporter Katie Scotcher. It's a major shake-up of this country's water infrastructure management. 67 councils storm drinking and wastewater, or three waters, moved into the hands of four regional entities. But some, most notably Auckland, are reluctant to take up the government's plan, so it's trying to sweeten the deal. A $2.5 billion package has been put on the table, but Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern says it's not because the government's worried councils won't get on board. This is simply an acknowledgement that this is a significant transfer of assets. Two billion dollars is for councils to invest in infrastructure to ensure they're better off. The remaining 500 million is to help them manage the financial impacts of the reforms or to make sure they're not worse off. The total pot of money will be divvied up among councils based on population and deprivation. Auckland will receive the most, more than 500 million. Not only is this about making sure that communities have safe drinking water, it's about also making sure that it's affordable. Nationals Christopher Luxon reckons the government's trying to bribe councils. It was a sweetener to try and get councils across the line to, to buy into their reforms. And the answer is many councils you know, and CEOs are actually 
you know, I think they're seeing through this. Nelson Mayor Rachel Rees thinks the funding will help address council's concerns. We want to make sure that our um, region um, benefits from the reform and now we just need to work through the detail to ensure that there aren't any unintended consequences and also that the way the structure is put together ensures that our local voice is heard. Westland Mayor Bruce Smith wants time to consider the proposal too. The devil's in the detail. So we'll take it back, we'll, we'll go through the detail, we'll have a look at it, we'll see what it means long term. Local government has six to eight weeks to consider the proposals before it meets with officials again to discuss the next steps. At this stage, it's not mandatory for councils to opt in. But watch this space. Jacinda Ardern hasn't ruled out making it mandatory and says it would be better if every council was on board. It's 17 minutes past six and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. Protesters remain at the site of the controversial Kennedy Point Marina on Waiheke Island tonight, despite the arrest of three people today. Putik has been protesting against the development for 129 days, which has seen violent clashes between occupiers and security personnel. Police arrived at the site early this morning, removing the makeshift campsite where protesters had been. Te Aurewa, Rolleston reports. We're here occupying... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. OK, you're under arrest, OK, for trespass. An early morning live stream showed protesters living on the construction platform of the Kennedy Point Marina site being interrupted. Police arrived in numbers, swarming the platform, arresting protesters and removing the makeshift campsite. Three people were arrested and taken to the Mount Eden custody unit. Megan Manuka is a member from the protest group Protect Putiki and says the group have been negotiating with police over the last week. She says they've been protecting Waiheke's largest korora, or little blue penguin, species. There's 34 burrows here. I've been spending, I've been here for the last month and I've heard the baby, the chicks, they're hatching. They're all mating, singing, and right next to them is a machine. The police say there have been ongoing issues between developers and protesters at the site, and their focus was on ensuring the safety of all parties. In a statement, Inspector Gary Davey from Auckland City Police said police were deployed to Kennedy Point, Putiki Bay, on Waiheke Island. Earlier this morning, police arrested and removed three people that were trespassing on a pontoon inside the construction. Zone. Police remain present at the site and we are monitoring the situation. The Green Party spoken in support of the protest group and honouring Te Tiriti or Waitangi. MP Chloe Swarbrick says she's involved in discussions to ensure things remain peaceful and the korora are protected. She questions the police presence this morning. Throughout the past several weeks, as we have seen with regard to the escalating uh, violence in particular, uh, particularly those at the hands of certain security guards, uh, that we are following up with the police about what the process is going to be to see those charges processed as well. Megan Manuka says the protest is not over. From a Thai ao Māori perspective, these penguins were here before us and therefore are our ancestors. I liken it, you know, it's like somebody has come into our, your grandmother's house, installed a machine that's going to kill her slowly and telling us that we can't do anything about it. The Nazi Power Trust Board say the consultation process carried out by the developer and Auckland Council for the marina development was inadequate. They say the Trust Board was continuing their fight to protect the native korora species on Waiheke Island in the Environment Court. The developer Kennedy Point Boat Harbour Limited says works on site will recommence once it is considered safe to no, resume. I, I want my phone. And in breaking news, the COVID response minister has just released a statement saying that the quarantine-free travel bubble to Victoria will be paused. That bubble will be paused. Uh, the press statement says quarantine-free travel from Victoria to New Zealand will be paused from 1.59 a.m. New Zealand time Friday. The decision follows updated public health advice from New Zealand officials and a growing number of cases and locations of interest. The pause will run for at least four days from 1.59 a.m. New Zealand time, Friday 16 July, and be subject to further review on Monday. 
The Minister says, as with previous pauses, we acknowledge the frustration and inconvenience that comes with any interruption to trans-Tasman travel, travel rather, but given the ongoing level of uncertainty around transmission in Melbourne, this is the right action to take. He says it's keeping in keeping with our consistently cautious approach to preventing COVID-19 entering the New Zealand community. Now, just to repeat that, there is a pause to the quarantine-free travel bubble with Victoria that comes into play at 1.59 a.m. Friday morning. A portable pool is being brought on site to hold Orphan Orca Tour as an incoming storm looks set to make sea conditions too rough. The bad weather also put a stop to air and sea searches today, and as Kirsty Frame reports, that's likely to continue for some days. Tours captured the hearts of many, but as the days roll on, caring for the baby orcas getting harder. At Plymouth and Harbour today, focus was on minding his health and strengthening his pen as well started to rock water levels. Crew say Toa is in a stable condition and has perked up significantly since he beached on Sunday afternoon. Tracy Cooper from Whale Rescue has been on the scene since Monday. Uh, we've been feeding him uh, formula uh, for the last couple of days. Uh, so once he's had a feed, he gets quite a bit of energy. Um, and then sometimes he needs a little bit of quiet time, a little bit of rest. As conditions worsen, though, the Department of Conservation is preparing to transfer him into a portable pool to protect both the calf and those caring for him. Docks Marine Species Manager Ian Angus says the contingency plan has been forced upon the teams and if the transfer occurs, the orca will be monitored closely. You know, we'll have vets on site, we'll do an assessment um, at the time. You know, it's a tough call and a difficult call to make that we'd prefer to avoid if we could, but weather's dictating otherwise. And then we'll just make, um, make a transfer of the orca from the current pen you know, carefully monitoring its health and place it in the pool and then monitor its health beyond that. Heavy rain, winds and swells along the Plymouth and coast has also forced teams to pause their search for orca pods today. Angus Hines from Met Service says the turn in weather is set to last some days. That wind is going to continue to rise uh, through Friday and Saturday and then we're looking at a very windy uh, couple of days, Friday, Saturday, even Sunday, with very strong, blustery northwest winds. Uh, that is also going to come in with some rainfall. Doc confirmed it was too dangerous to send out their search vessels today, with locals also keeping their boats ashore. Josh Hayes from Kapiti District's Aero Club says they weren't able to get in the air either, which may be the case for a few days. It just becomes too unsafe uh, with our team. It's, you're changing minute by minute. Uh, where you get heavy showers coming through and the visibility drops to almost nothing. And of course, all you, you see when you look down is white caps on the water. It's just almost impossible to spot anything on the water. At this stage, it's looking unlikely that an air search will be able to be mounted until Sunday. Despite the challenges, DOC is still encouraging the public to report any orca pod sightings. The South African government is increasing its troop deployment tenfold to deal with violence sparked by the jailing of former President Jacob Zuma. Shops and businesses have been looted and destroyed over the last four days. Dozens have died and more than 1,700 have been arrested. The BBC's Vumane Makize has this report from Johannesburg, which begins with the President's latest comments. At the beginning of this unrest, there may have been some people who sought to agitate for violence and disorder along ethnic lines. President Cyril Ramaphosa has condemned the unrest and said the military was being deployed to restore calm. We know that the majority of our people have, out of principle, refused to be mobilized along these ethnic lines. However, what we are witnessing now are opportunistic acts of criminality with groups of people instigating chaos merely as a cover for looting and theft. Soldiers working with the police managed to catch a few rioters, but law enforcement remains heavily outnumbered. 
So we're in Jabulani Mall. We've got the members of the South African military and the police. We've got a number of different suspects. They've been detained, essentially. All of them are lying flat on their stomachs. And surrounding the area, really, is just complete devastation. The whole mall has been ransacked. ATMs are lying on the ground. Streams of paper around. Bottle stores restaurants, everything is just a complete mess. So these are just a number of the people, the police and the military guys have been able to arrest so far. The violence started after the arrest of former President Jacob Zuma. Mr. Zuma was recently sentenced to 15 months in jail for contempt of court. He's also facing charges of corruption. Despite his legal issues, Mr. Zuma still has a lot of support in his home province of KwaZulu-Natal and also in Gauteng, where Johannesburg is located. His supporters, who have mobilized on ethnic grounds, believe an attack on Mr. Zuma is an attack on the Zulu nation. COVID infections continue to rise in Tokyo a little over a week before the opening ceremony of the Olympics. Daily cases are approaching 1,000 and the city's outbreak has not yet peaked. The ABC's Jake Sturmer went to watch an Australian and Japanese women's football match. Kyoto in Western Japan has just come out of a state of emergency and thousands of eager fans snapped up the opportunity to come and watch some of the world's best players. There weren't that many green and gold shirts in the crowd, but they were there. We'll be out there cheering yeah. as loud as we can. I guess we have two beers already. We'll be OK. <laughs> we two beers <laughs> With our hand over our mouth. <laughs> Japan's women's soccer team, known as Nadeshiko, is ranked number 10 in the world. Australia is one better. Last night, the Matildas had momentum in the first half, but after conceding a penalty early in the second, they weren't able to equalise and lost 1-0. I'm sitting in the stands, socially distanced. Everyone's wearing a mask and it's clapping and drums rather than singing and cheering. It is unusual to have a stadium like this so quiet, but there is a sense of excitement. Everyone here seems to be thrilled to be watching live sport of this standard. Given come games time, they'll be watching it on TV. Spectators have been banned from venues in and around Tokyo. Matilda's coach Tony Gustafsson says he's not overly worried. I think most of our players are used to play with those circumstances because it's been a different year. Um, I think uh, we're used to it, even though we would love to have people in the stands, but we, we are prepared for it. Outside of the capital, here in Western Japan, feelings are mixed about the Games. This man was at the Olympics in Sydney. He knows how exciting the atmosphere is for crowds. He says it's unfortunate that it just won't be the same in Tokyo. Alrighty, so a bit of your feedback before we head off on the shootings today and the police pursuits. Um, this person says the police did very well today. Question is not whether they should be armed as they seem to manage well today. The question is why do we have a US style gun crime problem? Let's address the cause. Someone else says uh, we need more cops, not more guns. That from Peter in Dunedin. So what are our friends on First Up up to tomorrow morning? Well, Kote Kaupapa to Atahi Apopo from five tomorrow morning. They'll have the latest on Melbourne's looming lockdown. And they'll be live in Wellington with the team that are looking after the stranded orca calf, Tōwa. But that's all we've got time for tonight. Ko hoki mai anō mātou apopo. RNZ News headlines at 6.30. Quarantine-free travel with Victoria will be paused from just before 2 o'clock tomorrow morning at New Zealand time. Melbourne is expected to go into its fifth COVID-19 lockdown tonight. The police say a man arrested after two after stealing two cars and holding people at gunpoint in Auckland this morning is in hospital with serious injuries. The largest shipment yet of the Pfizer vaccine has arrived here with about 180,000 doses, part of the total 1 million due to arrive during July. Our next news and weather is at 7. This week, on the Our Changing World, I talk to researchers from Massey University about what we can learn from studying birdsong and why the fairer of the sex has been traditionally overlooked.
You can only answer the questions you ask. So if you don't ask a question about female song, then you're not going to be researching into it. Follow Our Changing Worlds on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or iHeart. Or listen Thursdays and nights just after the nine o'clock news on RNZ National. Looking forward to that, Claire, because that's just out over about three and a half hours from now. On RNZ National Nights, I'm Brian Crump getting ready for another edition of that show. My first guest, however, after the news at seven is Eric Brenstrom, formerly a severe weather forecaster with Met Service. These days he's just a meteorologist. Well, not really just, he's a very good one. And tonight he's talking about the global weather and that includes the heat waves in North America. And I'll be asking him, just what is a heat dome? Hadn't heard of that phrase before until Canada, Western Canada, got really hot and then bits of it caught fire. A heat dome. And what causes it? That's Eric after seven ahead.